and um, I now want to um, introduce our third speaker, uh, Richard Peets, who is uh, a historic buildings inspector uh, working for Historic England in the South East, extremely important role. And uh, I hope everybody can hear us uh, at the back. Oh, can you not? Oh, right. Well, that's uh, something's gone. Uh, oh, that may make it better. Sorry. Uh, I hope now you will be able to, and Richard will speak close to the microphone. So, Richard Peace, uh, Historic Buildings Inspector of Historic England and South East, um, is going to uh, give another perspective, um, talking about um, the so called godfather of Gothic, George Edmund Street. Richard. Good afternoon. Can you all hear? Yes. Okay. George Edmund Street has more in common with um, soul legend James Brown than you might think. Both had a superhuman capacity for work. Artists who um, helped define the style they were working in. And they both got through a remarkable number of wives. I don't know if Street wore a cape. This afternoon, I'd like to talk to you about what he did in Oxford Diocese, why should we should care about it, how much of it survives, and then comes the tricky bit. How important is it, and how much should we keep? And I want to set out some thoughts on how we can assess the significance of his interiors relative to each other, so we can make informed decisions about the future of these buildings. Let's start with a quick rundown of what he did. Street was just as an architect for Oxford from 1850 until his death in 1881. He was also Darcy's an architect of Winchester, York and Ripon. And he gets the job after an early client, William John Butler, vicar of Wantage, introduces him to the Bishop of Oxford, Samuel Wilberforce. And these two strike up a lifelong friendship. And there is so much of Street's work in Oxford and in the diocese because Wilberforce promotes him. At Bloxham, in the north of Oxfordshire, there's a series of letters written by Wilberforce to the parish advising them on the early stages of their restoration. And he gives them a very strong steer that Street is just the man they need, writing, he's a first-rate hand at dealing with old buildings. So, not surprisingly, Street gets called in. His output is vast. 23 new churches, 91 restorations. And that's 14% of all the current churches in the diocese. And his restorations range from adding portion of estuary to near-complete rebuilds. But in most cases, 78% of the total, he completely refurnishes the interior. And where he doesn't do this is because he's only been called in to do the chancel or only the nave. And of course, there's a good reason for this thoroughness. He's at the front edge of the Gothic revival. And when he gets called in, the church is normally filled with box pews and nearly fallen down. So he's got a, normally got a free hand and a mandate for dramatic change. Geographically, his spread is broad. This map showing all the churches he had a go at is, um, gives you a fairly even coverage across the diocese. And Street has a long working life. His first church, Biscopy, in Cornwall, was designed in 1846, and he's active right up to his death in 1881. Most of his work in Oxford happens during the 1850s and 1860s. Very little is done in the 1870s. This is unsurprising. He's completely absorbed by the Royal Courts of Justice at that point. And there's a great variety of church types. You get new big town churches like um, All Saints, Bourne Hill, Maiden Head, and this one, St. Phil and Jim's in Oxford. Um, you get the restoration of big town churches like High Wycombe and Burford. And then you get small scale restorations on tiny country churches like this one at Hulcott. And he's catering for all budgets. Here is Nash in Buckinghamshire, 
where he's got a tiny budget and falling in Berkshire where Blanche Walton of William Park enables him to do something really lavish. So that gives him a fairly wide spread of stuff. As to divine characteristics, the first thing you remember when you walk into what we call an attack street inter interior is that everything, all the fittings, the floor, the lot, have been personally designed by him. I used to think this was a myth. How could one man do so much? But the more I research, the more convinced I am that it all comes from his pen. <coughs> Surviving specifications for his work are unambiguous. There are little marginal sketches showing how tiles should be laid or screens detailed. These come from, from the specification from Roxham. And they always instruct fittings to be built as per architect's drawings by named craftsmen. These drawings rarely survive, but where they do, such as at Milton and Richwood, they are exquisite. We also know that he's not delegating any design decisions to his assistant. Norman Shaw recalls he wasn't even allowed to design a moulding when he was a pupil. In Streets of Victory in the Delta, an anonymous contributor, a former pupil, said that he would allow his pupils to do some designs, but would almost invariably alter them after they were done, saying, it's not that your work is necessarily bad, but it must be mine. He must have been insufferable to work <laughs> The only thing he does, as a rule, not control is stained glass. It's not because he doesn't like it, he loves designing stained glass, but normally his specifications call for plain diamond qu leaded quarries, and it's because generally he's been called in to fix a building that is in really bad condition, and the stained glass can wait till later. The second thing about his interiors is that they're all different. As he said himself, three fourths of the poetry of a building lie in its minor details, and boy, did he pay attention to details. He doesn't have a standard pew or a roof that he rolls out right across the diocese. Every building, pretty much, gets its own particular fitting, purposely designed for that building. And here are a bewildering variety of pews. <clears throat> occasionally, he reuses a design, but very occasionally. The only time I found him reuse a pew design is at Nash in Buckinghamshire and All Saints Born Hill. Apart from that, they are all different. Um, a couple of times, he reuses an ultra rail design. What he does is take a motif and come back to it again and again with a slightly different twist. Here are a set, selection of poppy heads on Chancel Street <coughs> with an oak leaf pattern on it, which he was really into in the 1850s. And you can see they're all ever so slightly different. And after the 1850s, he moves on. He doesn't do it again. His style is always distinctive. You always know it's street. It's robust. Everything feels really solid and purposeful. Shapes are bold. And while it's simple, this simplicity is deceptive. It's never crude. You can see at this at Westcott Buckles, a building that positively revels in simplicity. And here are the fittings. Everything has got this lovely, chunky feel to it. And it's all very plain, but very carefully proportioned. And the detail being spare. But I think it works with the architecture of the building. If he'd done something really fancy, I think it wouldn't have been nearly as effective. Of course, as a good high Victorian, he loves polychromy, particularly pulpits, floors, and reredos. And here's a nice series of abstract reredos with crosses in the centre. Of course, at the time, you couldn't put a cross on an altar. That's banned. So you put it in the reredos. This group comes from North Buckinghamshire from the 1860s. And often, when he gets, he gets the contract to restore or build a group of churches in the same area at about the same time, and they tend to have quite a lot of common characteristics. Deddington and Bloxham are quite similar. 
and up in the north of Buckinghamshire, he does this um, series of restorations with this um, lattice pattern stone <coughs> nail. He doesn't do it anywhere else, just in these four buildings, which are all quite close together. <coughs> I don't know why, but maybe there's a good quarry nearby. It's consistently good. You never go into a street building and think, gosh, he's having an off day here. Often, it's amazing what he can do when he's short of cash. Here is Nash, this cheap church, contrasted with Wright Walter, another one built with um, Rolton family money. And you can see that even in the cheap one, he's using the space really well. What carving there is, is really effectively applied. And while you get lots more elaborate and fanciness in Bright Walton, and I think in aesthetic terms, it's richer and more beautiful, Nash is still telling an important part of the street story. His vision is for the renewal of the church and it for it to be accessible to as many people as possible, not just those with deep pockets. So I don't think he put less effort into Nash. I think he put more effort into it. Another characteristic is respect for mainly work. Oh, here are the fittings, before I forget, of Graham Walton and Nash. And you can see there is a great, clear difference in the amount of um, applied detail and sort of lusciousness of them, really. Um, but going back to the medieval work, Street is not a conservationist in the way we would think about it, but he is very careful about medieval work. Um, and when he finds some medieval pews, like these ones at Steventon and at Scott under Wishwood, he always repairs them and includes them in his building. Um, but early in his career, he does remove what were probably medieval screens at St. Michael's Northgate in Oxford in 1854 and St. Peter's Drayton um, in 1855. Later, he seems to be much more respectful of screens, painstakingly restoring them wherever possible, such as St. Mary's blocks. In fact, screens seem to be the only element of furnishings which develop during his career. Early on, he favours a low wall rather than a full screen to maximise views of the altar. And here are a few examples of it. <clears throat> By the end of his career at Hombre St. Mary, a memorial to his third wife, and outside the diocese in Surrey, he's putting in full height screens like this one. Um, possibly it's due to changing fashion, high church ritual is more fashionable. But this is also a very, very personal project, so maybe this is now decide, he's decided what he wants. Otherwise, at least as far as fittings are concerned, what he does doesn't change that much throughout his long career. Um, here's Milton under Witchwood and the rather blurry side of um, Ashley Green. Milton under Witchwood is from 1853 to 4, Ashley Green from 1872 to 4. And Basically, what they're doing is looking pretty. Is that better? Sorry. Pretty similar. Um, and the detail is pretty consistent. Um, if you look at the, and if you look at the quatrefoils on the screen with Ashley Green, they're very similar to Bright Walton back in 1861, and the. Um, Little fleur de lune pattern um, is first seen at West of Barton in 1856. So he's coming back again and again to these sort of details. So we've seen Street is prolific, he's distinctive, he pays incredible attention to detail, and he creates insisted interiors of consistently good quality. And the next question is how much survives? And the good news is that the sheer quantity of his output means there is still quite a lot out there. But there is no such thing as a complete street interior. To understand why, have a look at this plan of Whitten as he left it. Um, 
you can see it's absolutely rammed full of seats because he had to get everybody in the parish in without resorting to galleries. And the result gets very messy. So there's been a gradual process of thinning out of pews, which began in the later 19th century when everyone wanted a side chapel or two. Also, we've lost a lot of its light fittings, and most of these interiors have lost their rather, to be honest, wacky 19th century painting scenes. But I'd say about 55, so that's about 50% of his interiors remain substantially intact. They've just been nibbled around the edges. This map, showing survival, shows no obvious pattern. But in general, town churches have fared less well than country churches. His work at Whitney, Burford, and High Wycombe is now very fragmentary. This is not surprising. More money, more people means a great, uh, greater urge to fiddle. His hysterias historically have not fared well at the hands of rich patrons who often get the urge to um, redecorate later in the 19th century. Here's Hedsall, um, which was completely redone by Street in 1861-2, but um, completely redone by Hepworth in 1892, and pretty much the only thing that survives from the street restoration is the, um, is the pulpit. The thing in recent years that has been bad for um, interiors are low church congregations. This is St. Ed's in Oxford, um, and you can see that it's pretty much completely gone. And now Queen and Terry wants to put a gallery in it. Um, <coughs> large concentrations of priests are also bad for survival. <laughs> Here's poor old Cubston, right next to the theological college. Um, and everyone wants to leave their mark on the building. So it gets an Edwardian altar with riddle posts, it's a 1930s screen. Um, and again, not that much of the street interior survives. Currently, the main pressure on these interiors is the desire for flexible use in the nave, and thus the desire for the removal of pews. Congregations often want their buildings used for purposes other than east-facing worship. And the smaller and the struggling ones often see this as a route to relevance and survival. Victorian pews aren't well appreciated by their congregations, who find them uncomfortable. And because there is so much Victorian seating around, they don't value it for its rarity. And I think also Victorian connotations of party and morality often don't play well with current congregations. <coughs> they want to say, we're a church of the 20th century, or the 21st century, hopefully, not the 19th. Um, so in the last five years, there have been five deep purity streams, schemes of street churches in the diocese. It's a trickle, not a flood. But we're losing about one year, and I reckon we'll run out of good street interiors in 2068. I don't think we can stand canoe like and hold back the tide. There will be instances where more flexible use is the only realistic way of conserving the building as a whole. But I think we need to be clear on which interiors matter more than others and identifying the ones that we should fight hard to keep. And I think the best way of approaching this is to have a blacklist, ones that are less exciting, a whitelist, ones we really care about, and should stay as much as they are, and the greatest, the ones in between. The blacklist, I think, is relatively easy to define. Those with little or virtually nothing left. And that's around 25 buildings, about 22% of the total. And Chalfonts and Peter in Buckinghamshire is typical of this sort of thing. It's a really rather good street chancel bolted <coughs> into a um, commissioner's box, which is pretty <coughs> strange. Um, but in terms of fittings, all that's survived from the street period are the um, pulpit and the reredos. Everything else has come later. 
But just because we're not interested in it from a street point of view doesn't mean it's an interior that we shouldn't care about. Here's Fulman in Buckinghamshire. And again, it's not that interesting from a street studies point of view. Most of this derives from Stenning's restoration of 1882. But and it's that that gives the building its internal character. And that, I think, which is rather more important in this circumstance. And I think putting a whitelist together is made more tricky by the fact that it's not as simple as just the ones that are largely intact. There are buildings that have lost their names, but have really good chances that are worth worrying about. Here's an example at Cuddington in Buckinghamshire. Really nice good chancel with good furnishings and a pool pen. Um, better than most, actually. But something hideous has happened in the nave. And I don't think just because the hideous things happened, we should give up on the other. And there's also a problem that some pews matter in particular buildings more than others. Um, here's whole recent area again looking west, and you see they've already had their pews out. But I don't think the impact is as bad as in Cuddington, even though they've used the same chairs. Partly because the architecture of this building is much stronger, and I think can take the change more, and partly because they've retained the floor, so it retains a more Victorian character. I'd also like to contrast Eastbury in Berkshire with All Saints, Bourne Hill in Maidenhead. Um, Eastbury is first church in the diocese, and Bourne Hill, one of his masterworks. And I think the pews are actually more important in Eastbury because they really give the church character and help define the space. Whereas those used at Bourne Hill are very, very light, they're simple, and I think they were supposed to be very lightweight, so they didn't get in, in the way of the architecture. And this seems to be something he does in bigger buildings, and at St. Phil and Jim's in Oxford, similar type of building. He uses chairs rather than benches. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think that <laughs> these benches in All Saints Bourne Hill don't matter. I think they are significant. I'm just saying that in terms of their contribution to the building as a whole, it may not be as much as a Deesbury. I think there's also clear differences in quality. Although consistently good, some fittings are simply better than others. Let's have a look at Chiltern here and Boyne Hill. And you see, he does pull plates, and he does pull plates. And this difference in quality doesn't tend to be restricted to one item. You don't get an amazing Viridos, and then everything else is a little dull. Um, here we have Sol Salford, a very complete interior, and Bloxham. Um, they're both complete, but Bloxham <coughs> is far richer, and I think far better. If you look at the um, details of the interior, you can see that they are, there's a real quality difference between the two of them. <coughs> so, taking factors, all these hats into account, I'd like to propose putting together a whitelist, which has the obvious masterpiece at the top, the really good buildings in the diocese, it's completely designed by him, where he had the resources to do something special. And I think that's about five or six churches. All Saints Bond Hill, Forley, Bright Walton, Milton, Witchwood, Westport. And although now not a church, St. Philip and Jim's Oxford. And as you can see from Forley, these are wonders to behold. And then I think there's a group of really good, lavish interiors that are associated with restorations that survive either largely intact or as intact chancels. Again, it's a relatively small group. And I think Peasmore is a good example of this, a chancel of 1865, a great draft gone to an early 19th century preaching box. 
Um, very good for or very good for us. Nice um, screen, all these things. And then there's a group of much plainer interiors that are associated with his own buildings. <coughs> things like Coles Hill and Buckinghamshire. I think these are important as part of an ensemble. He created an entire interior and he was going for an effect and the fittings form an important part of that. And the final group, possibly the creamless rather than the whitest, are those interiors which illustrate how streets solve particularly difficult problems. Um, North Lee is a good example of this, where that thing looks rather dark, I don't know if it's any better for you, um, is a medieval root um, drawing, um, doom painting, on top of a timber frame. And Street had the problem of, well, what do you do with this? You can't, I want to open up the chancel, but I've got to leave that in place. So he designed this rather wonderful screen. And it comes with a fairly complete interior and some, pe some benches that are very, very plain, but they are important because they are part of a whole and they do make sense of the screen, which will look a bit funny without them in front of it defining the space. Lastly, we have a group in the middle, the greatest. Interiors associated with restorations which are reasonably well preserved, but the individual fittings are not remarkable. And Chilton and Berkshire, I think, is a good example of this. I think these have some significance and ought to be preserved where possible, but I think we need to be open to arguments for change here. So where does all this get us? I think we can identify the street interiors in the Oxford Diocese we should really care about. I think we can I don't know, identify the ones that aren't so important and the ones in between. And put like that, it doesn't so sound like much, but for my day-to-day -day work as a historic building inspector, it's a big step. I no longer stand in the chase, ch chancel, faced with a major reordering, thinking, well, this is pretty complete, but to be honest, I don't know how good it is compared with the rest of the of streets output. And I think I can also communicate to parishes rather more effectively why they should love and care for their Victorian interior. I think there's a lot more to be done here. I've managed to visit all these buildings in the diocese and do the bulk of the basic documentary research about them. I now have a lot of information which I need to get into a rather more digestible form and produce something like a gazetteer so that other churches can use it as a basis rather than having to go back and reinventing the wheel every time a statement of significance is um, written. But I think there's also a job of work to be done articulating relative significance in a more systematic way. And I think probably some sort of weighted scorecard approach where you give everything a number and I've always shied away from that because mechanistic, mechanistic approaches like that tend to give slightly mad results. But I think with the amount of buildings that you have to get through and compare, I think something like that has to be done. But I think also a bit of a wider context is needed. How many other good interiors by other big name architects are there in the diocese? And how does Oxford as a diocese compare with streets and outlook as a home? Have I got a really big pocket of them? Or is it a bit sort of fairly normal for somewhere where it's a diocese and architect? That's me.